Um, you see that some people are asking for call sites for trading time, and Scott actually gave us some time for you guys to relax. So you know. <laughs> um, so Scott, it's a great pleasure to have you here. Uh, Scott did his um, PhD from uh, University of New Mexico in the late uh, mid 90s, 1996. Then he worked at uh, Gila, Colorado, um, and then joined uh, no one else than John Hall to start uh, work on frequency metrology back in 1998. And uh, he was, you know, among the people that built the first self-reference octave spanning uh, frequency comp. So we are you're gonna hear from the the founders of this thing here. Um, and since 2000, Dr. Didems is. Um, is a staff member and project leader at uh, um, NIST, uh, Balder. And he's been working on frequency metrology, stabilization of you know, uh, frequency comms, and all sorts of uh, nonlinear optics things. It's a great pleasure to have you here, Scott, please. Thank you very much, Gustavo. I want to thank um, Gustavo and Tiago for organizing this really nice symposium. Um, it's, screw that up a little bit. It's actually uh, my fourth time in Brazil. I've been to Campinas a few times. And in fact, my first time in Campinas, I didn't even really know anything about this institute or what was going on here. But I came when I was about 20 years old. I was living in Atibaia with a family. And I met a scientist. And he said, he goes, hey, you study science. Maybe there's something interesting for you to see in Campinas. So he brought me here, really nice Brazilian guy, like a lot of Brazilians I've met. They're very generous with their time. And he brought me up here, and I spent an afternoon looking around Unicamp. And I, in fact, came to this institute. And I, I remember going to the fiber optics lab. And I think I met Hugo. I don't remember so well the people who I met, but I do remember um, him in particular. So it's a real pleasure to be back here and to be able to um, you know, not only enjoy the, the science and the, the ideas that are being spread around here, but get to know some, some more new people. So I really appreciate the opportunity. So I'm going to tell you about um, optical frequency combs. And that's really a story that relates to nonlinear optics and the meeting of ultra-fast and ultra-stable. So if you don't know what that means, hopefully by the end of the talk, you'll have an idea. Um, maybe, is, maybe I turn off those lights, this one in front. Is that the bottom one? OK. Maybe you can see a little better. Um, so this is a school on. Nanophotonics, nonlinear optics, quantum optics. So I think today I won't get it, but tomorrow I'll get to something that's, OK, at least it comes close to nanophotonics, maybe. It's, it's microphotonics. So I will tell you a little bit tomorrow about frequency combs and microresonators. But um, today and throughout, there will be a lot of nonlinear optics. I'm, I'm not going to really touch on quantum optics, though. That's not my area. So. This is a summer school, and so maybe it's interesting to just stop and think, or it's a winter school, I guess. For me, it's summer, I'm sorry. <laughs> a winter school, and it's interesting to stop and, and just ponder a minute about, you know, how, do, how does learning work? And I, I kind of like thinking about that in pictures. And here's two, two ideas, maybe, of how learning works as it relates to, to climbing. So, so here's one picture from a mountain in Peru. And you see these, these people, these brave people, walking up this ridge to get to the top there, right? And so there's a leader. There's one person who's in front, maybe the first person to go there. You know, maybe it was, it was you know, some of the pioneers you heard about today in, in talks earlier. And then maybe there's some people following behind. And, and that's actually kind of a decent model of learning. And sometimes from behind, you don't follow the same path. You go off a little bit. You know, maybe you learn something new along the way. I actually like uh, this picture of perhaps how learning works a little better. This is, this is a place called the Bramante Staircase. It's in the Vatican. And I guess like, like um, you, do, you, you don't have to be a member of the, the Pope's Academy of Science to visit there. I visited there, and for 10 euros, you can also visit there and see this, <laughs> see this beautiful place. So, so this is really interesting. It's actually a double helix staircase. And here you're looking down. And the staircase comes up. And here's looking from the bottom, kind of going up to, to enlightenment, to heaven, <laughs> if you will. But, but the interesting thing about this path, I think, of knowledge is that, is that you circle around, right? And, and in fact, that's exactly what's been happening here. I've seen it myself as I sat in, sat in, the, in the audience, is that 
you heard something about nonlinear polarization in chi 3, and that was described very nicely by, by Paulo. And then it came back around again, right? And Sid talked about it. And then, and then Roy just talked about it again. And each time you come back around, you, you gain a little bit of understanding. So you should not feel bad about not understanding something the first time. It's quite natural. And, and, and you will never understand it fully until you've circled around it many different times in many different perspectives. So I hope, and you will see in my talk, I will, I will present some of these same ideas about nonlinear optics, but from a different perspective. So I hope that gives you a different angle and, and increases your, your level of knowledge and learning. So, so this is what I will, will tell you about. I guess I, I'm up here four times, so I kind of have four points I'm going to talk about. I, I, I first will give some, let's warm up with some general background on clocks and pre precise timing. So that isn't really nonlinear optics yet, but ultimately you will see how nonlinear optics and, and micro nanophotonics ties into that. Then I will, I will get to this topic of the optical frequency comb, which is related to how you count cycles of light. And how do we use lasers and nonlinear optics to count cycles of light? Uh, tomorrow, I will then take a step down to the micro scale and talk about, you know, chip scale. Can we try to address this, this question? Can we make this frequency comb technology on a chip? Could it go from something that was, you know, kind of a meter square down to a centimeter square? And then in my last talk, I will present some app applications and opportunities for frequency combs. What are, what are some other interesting things maybe besides clocks that, that people might like to use these for? So I'll, I'll give you a little bit of introduction about where I'm from. So uh, NIST, where I, where, I visit, where I live, is about in the center of the United States in this town called Boulder in the state of Colorado. And sometimes people refer to Boulder as 25 square miles surrounded by reality. It's a pretty unique town, and if you come and visit, I think you would get a, a flavor for how unique it is. It's, it's, some of its uniqueness is how beautiful it is. We sit at the base of the Rocky Mountains. These peaks up here are about four to 5,000 meters high. It's a nice, nice climbing, nice skiing, and Boulder is right at the base of them. And there's only about 100,000 people, but we're just a little like, uh, like this Unicamp in Campinas. We're just a short distance from downtown Denver, which is about one and a half million people. Part of, for a scientist, part of what really makes Boulder unique is it's, it's a meeting of, of several federal research labs, NIST, where I work, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, as well as NOAA and NCAR, and these two are related to atmospheric research. And there's also, also the home of the University of Colorado. All those red buildings you see there are the University of Colorado. It's the flagship university of the, the state of Colorado. And together, these, these federal institutes and the university have spun off many high-tech companies and startups. Sometimes people talk about it as kind of a little Silicon Valley of the Rocky Mountains. So that's what our, our university looks like on a nice day. And um, as in many American universities, the, the biggest building is the football stadium. The highest paid employee at the university is the football coach. <laughs> Not our Nobel laureates. <laughs> so. Um, Unfortunately, our football team is not so good these days, but <laughs> people still like to go to the games. Um, this is the, the physics building, and the institute you've, you've heard about, Jilla, uh, a few times is, is this building here. So, uh, and these are, these are the foothills. These are sometimes called the flat irons. If you like to climb, rock climbing with ropes, it's crawling with crazy people on the weekend doing all of that. So the guy who took this photo, flew his airplane just about one kilometer south. And you see, this is where I work. This is the NIST and NOAA campus. And this was on a spring day, late spring, when there was just a dusting of snow on the foothills there. So it's, it's, we get a lot of sunshine also there. The, the sky is 300 days a year of sunshine. So it's quite a beautiful place. And our, our campus, our buildings in a federal, a federal research lab, you can't have pretty buildings. They have to be utilitarian. So our buildings aren't as nice as the university, but we're closer to the mountains. And you can go out the, the back door of our institute and go running or hiking up here um, at lunchtime or after work. So. so let me just say a few words about NIST. It's, a, it's the US National Standards Lab. It used to be called the Bureau of Standards. And the key mission of, of NIST is to promote US innovation. And we do that 
through science and research and education and building infrastructure and investments for the future. So our job is to really try to develop technologies and, and learn about the science that's going to propel innovation in the future. Oops, excuse me. There's, there's about 375 employees. That's like NIST employees. There's about 350 students, uh, postdocs, contractors, researchers from around the world. There's actually, in fact, one professor from Unicamp here, uh, Flavio Cruz, who is working with me now in Brazil, or in, in my lab back in, in Boulder. We have about a hundred million budget, and um, it's, NIST is a, is a big institute. In fact, the headquarters are outside Washington, D.C., but still about 20% of the laboratory research is in, is in Boulder. So there's all kinds of basic research going on from chemical physics, nanotechnology, quantum information. You know, we have some very famous people in this regard. These are pictures of the, of the ions that Dave Wineland and his crew trap and do some of their incredible work on. We have, uh, of course, clocks, lasers and photonics, kind of my area, and, and different advanced materials there. So it's a broad range of research. The, the group that I'm a part of is in time and frequency, and so we are the people who actually are, in fact, in our division, build um, cesium fountain clock that defines the second for the United States. So this is, this is the birth or the home place of the, the U.S. second. But there's all kinds of other clock and timing related research from clocks on a chip. Here's a grain of rice next to a little clock that my colleague John Kitching built. Um, there's uh, different types of clocks. There's the ion clocks. This is Wineland's work again. Optical lattice clocks. Uh, Professor Bagnato will, will, this is the kind of research that he is doing and, and the cold fountain clock kind of work. And, and my area is more with the optical frequency comb. So you'll hear a lot more about that throughout my talk. Okay, so, so let's zoom in a little bit. That's a very broad perspective. Let's start to talk about clocks and precise timing. And, and you probably have seen this, this painting by Salvador Dali, a persistent, the persistence of memory. Some people like to say, well, look at there's all of these clocks that are like all misshapen and folded down. And people, Dali made this painting in the 1930s, shortly after the Einstein's theory of relativity, and people are saying, well, oh, look, he's, he's expressing that time is relative. Well, I, I don't know this for a fact, but I read, and, and actually Dolly said he was more inspired by melting cheese than, than by <laughs> relative time. <laughs> anyway, it's, it's an interesting, interesting picture. So, so let's just think about time scales for a little bit. You know, in, in Physics, there's a huge range, over 60 orders of magnitude when we talk about time scales. It's spectacular. If you think about it, it's, it's mind-blowing. You know, the, the, everything from the age of the universe on the order of 10 to the 17 or 10 to the 18 seconds, you know, and, and down to, to maybe 10 to the minus 18 seconds. These are the, the shortest human-made events, attosecond pulses that people can now generate and measure. And even shorter, you know, I, I run out of space here. You know, if you go to the Planck time, where, you know, kind of how long did it take light to cross the initial singularity? It's kind of 10 to the minus 43 seconds. It, you know, the, the top quark was discovered about a decade ago. Its lifetime was maybe 10 to the minus 25 seconds. So this huge range. And, and here I tried to lay out a few other things you might be aware of or, or know about. I, no offense to the chemists, but we give you one decade, 10 to the minus 12. Physics covers the rest. Uh, are there any chemists out there? <laughs> but but it's, it's maybe interesting that, that out of 60 orders of magnitude, our human experience, you know, maybe human evolution, 100,000 years or so, it, it stretches out here. But, but humans, you, you really don't do anything much faster than a second, right? Or you really don't care about it. And if you think about it, you know, a year or maybe 10 years, okay, a lifetime, but it, it's rare you find someone who really focuses on one thing for, for more than 10 years. So we kind of have this between a set, uh, you know, maybe it's eight orders of magnitude or so that, that we understand and experience time to be. I mean, it's, I don't want to get philosophical, but it's kind of interesting to think about, you know, what does that really mean and what does that imply? We, we, you know, we can study these things down here. How long does it take an electron to go around the hydrogen atom? 
But in our, in our everyday experience, this is where we live. So let's think about a little bit more about what makes a clock and, and how do we attempt to measure time. Well, every clock consists of an oscillator and some counting mechanism. So early on, it was the Earth's rotation you know, that, that was used to define time. That was the oscillator. Or maybe it was a pendulum. Or, or in the early 1900s, people discovered the piezoelectric effect in quartz. And that turned out to be a really good oscillator. But then you need a counting mechanism, OK? So, so if the Earth's, for, first of all, maybe it was a guy who scratched some lines on the cave where he lived, right? Day one, day two. There was the counting mechanism. You know, sundials, or, or in this case, the gears and hands, the mechanical uh, mechanism of a clock. For quartz crystals, you start to get introduce electronics, and you use electronic techniques and devices to count cycles. So if we want to talk about atomic clocks, the big difference is that it, it, it's actually all the same thing, but you, you tie the oscillator to an atomic frequency, something that you believe, at least physics tells us, is that the atomic frequency of a cesium atom here in Brazil should be the same in the United States as in the England. So this is why it's hard to take a piece of quartz and cut it so perfectly that it oscillates at exactly the same frequency in every, every situation. But with atoms, um, they, they just come to us that way. So that's, that's why people would ultimately want to use atoms as the ultimate reference for a clock. So in, in, in a microwave clock, you would use a microwave transition. In cesium, it's a hyperfine transition in the cesium atom. And then you have a microwave oscillator and some sort of electronic counter. For optical clocks, the, the, the oscillator is now a laser. It's the beam of light. This thing right here, those crests and valleys of the laser beam are the oscillator for your optical clock. And then as the reference, you would use an optical transition in an atom. That poses a problem, and that's where this is in, because these oscillations of light happen really quickly, about one or two femtoseconds per cycle. And so how are you going to count those? And, and that's where this femtosecond laser originally came in. Let's, I like history. I, I, I really enjoy the history of science. I appreciated Roy's talk the other night because it gives you some perspective on how people got to where we were. You know, what was the winding path that someone else took, right? So, so here's, here's maybe the first mention of uh, atomic clock. And there's a very famous person, Isidore Rabi, probably the, the father of atomic clocks, in 1944. So this was the New York Times. So you know, we were chatting the other day. Everyone wants a publication in Nature or Science. I once heard that, that if you were a scientist at Bell Labs, back in the heyday of Bell Labs, that if you had a publication in, in Nature, that was great. But if you got your work on, in the New York Times on Science Thursday, that's when, and then you got the big bonus. <laughs> so, so Robbie's um, announced the cosmic pendulum. And there's some really nice um, English in this as well. It's kind of small. I won't read it to you. You could, you could look this up, or I could give it to you. Um, I guess you will get it in the notes. You could read some of that. But it was the first idea that, that atoms could be used to help define time. The, the work, uh-oh. <laughs> there, there's the optical fiber working again. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> um, so the, the, Robbie's ideas led to, to what is now the, the definition of the second. And that is uh, based on cesium atoms. And again, I mentioned that it's, it's, it's a microwave transition. So it's not an optical transition, but it's a hyperfine splitting in cesium that has been defined to have exactly this frequency. And there's kind of a complicated apparatus that people use to trap and cool the cesium. Maybe Professor Bagnato will, will tell you more about how that works. But the, the, what I want to say about this is that, that now these kind of clocks are at about an uncertainty of a part in 10 to the 16. So you can define that cesium frequency here, and that's about 10 digits, and you can add six more zeros behind it. That's, that's what the, the definition of the second is currently at. How would you do better? 
Well, let's just think about that. If, if, if I like to think of time in terms of rules. So let's imagine one second is the distance between my fingers, OK? So a cesium clock oscillates at about 10 billion cycles per second. That 9 million, 9 million or I'm sorry, 9 billion, the number that was there before, 192, 631, 770. So roughly 10 billion, OK? So in between my fingers, there are 10 billion little tick marks, OK? So what if we went to a higher frequency? So what if we, what, what's the ratio of a, what, how, how much higher is optical frequency than a microwave frequency? Five orders of magnitude, yeah. So now instead of, of, of 10 billion, we have maybe a quadrillion. So now it's like you took a ruler, and in between each tick, you added 100,000 more little ticks. So this is, this is the reason people got very excited about this, is that, hey, I could measure something with potentially 100,000 times greater precision. And in fact, it, it wasn't a, it, Roy talked about the introduction of the laser. It was just a few years after the laser was invented. In fact, a, a scientist, Ali Javan, who started thinking about, oh, wow, this helium neon laser with all of these cycles of light, this could be something that is really useful for making precision measurements with, because I could potentially have very fine control of those optical cycles. So let's talk a little bit about how one actually would make an optical clock. Well, I, I told you already, the, the pendulum of this clock is a laser itself. So it's the crest in the valley of the electromagnetic wave, OK? So here's, and this travels in time, OK? It's not sitting on a table. But the, the way the laser is, first of all, that, that oscillation, it's, it's already quite pure from the days of Ali Javan coming out of the laser. But you can make it even more pure, more sinusoidal, by stabilizing the frequency of that laser to some sort of a Fabry-Perot, an isolated Fabry-Perot. And I, I won't say anything more about that. But, but in this way, people can make a laser with a line width that is now on the order of 50 millihertz. OK, so imagine that, 50 millihertz out of a quadrillion hertz. OK, so it's like better, it's down, now down to about a part in 10 to the 16. So some of the light from the laser then, the, the laser is, is just going at whatever frequency it is. It may be very stable, but we need to slave this laser to the frequency of some atoms. So in some scheme and, and you know, simple picture is you just shine some, some laser light on the atoms, and you look at where the atoms fluoresce the most. That would be where they absorb the light and then re-emit it. And, and that happens near an atomic resonance. So we would like to steer, slowly steer, the frequency of this laser to match exactly this atomic resonance. And these are some of the atoms and ions that are used, at least around Boulder. There are others in different places. In fact, uh, you go to the building next door, and there's some calcium ions or atoms that, that are being explored for this kind of technology. So all that works well. But then you have, again, this problem of, of the counter and the readout. So we, we've now made a very perfect oscillator. We've steered its frequency so it matches an atomic transition, you know, some God-given transition that is the same here or there or anywhere around the world. But we don't know what that frequency is because these cycles of light are going by so quickly. All right? So that's a problem. But that's, that's what this frequency comb um, does for us. Let me just say a, a quick word about different types of clocks. Um, you know, maybe these are, these are more modern clocks, because it's, it's perhaps interesting, again, to, to get a little bit of perspective about kind of, again, the, the range of time scales, right? So, so, geez, hardly anyone uses a wristwatch anymore. But, but if you do, <laughs> there's probably a quartz crystal in that. In, in, your, in my cell phone, there's a little piece of quartz crystal. So there's like, I think there's, there's something like 10 billion quartz crystals produced every year. It's pretty remarkable. And those find their way into everything. But maybe this one is only good for about a second in a day. It's pretty small. Stability can be quite good and, and quite cheap, right? just a dollar or so. Maybe quartz even costs less than that. There's, if, if you have a scientific instrument, they, they take the quartz and they put it inside an oven and control the temperature very precisely. 
you can improve the, the stability dramatically that way. It's, cost goes up a little bit, not so much. If, if you add atoms, you can buy compact, it's about the size of an iPhone or a small box like that, that now you have atoms in there, and you see now you can go for a, about 1,000 years before you lose a second. And the price, it's actually still quite reasonable, 1,000 bucks you can buy from SRS, this company. Okay, if you, if you want to build that fountain clock, now you're talking about one second in, in 100 million years. Okay, and it, it costs you about a million bucks, unfortunately. And then the things that, that we are developing now, the, the next generation, are these optical clocks. Here's a view of a mercury ion trap. And this would neither gain or lose a second if you could start it now and you wanted to hang around that long. Or, or let's go back. <laughs> if at the Big Bang you could start one of these things, it would not have lost a second by the time it got here. So if there was someone around to keep it running. These things only run in the laboratory. At, at a second, I, I won't really talk about these metrics too much, but the stability is about part and 10 to the 16. And you know, it's a research device. And so <laughs> it's kind of expensive, but um, it's worth it. <laughs> so in, in all of these devices, again, just to repeat, you know, there's, there's a reference atom, a local oscillator, in some sort of counter or gears. <clears throat> it's interesting to, to lay out kind of how timekeeping has progressed through, through the past, you know, two, three, four hundred years. And that's what I, I tried to do in this plot here. And what's measured, what's shown there on the left is the, the uncertainty of the clock in seconds per day, okay? That's what's here. And then this is, this is the year of approximately when they were discovered or, or first built. So there's this Dutch scientist, Christian Huygens, who built first pendulum clock. And that's kind of it. Maybe in those times, it was 10 seconds per day. It was good to that. Very famous British man built this chronometer that could survive travel back and forth across the sea. I'll say, say a little bit more about that. The short clock was maybe the very best pendulum clock. And then, then you see shortly after that, we, we, quartz came online, and then there's this dramatic plunge as we went from kind of an astronomical, mechanical era into the atomic era. And now the, the best clocks are even down here at, at approaching much less than a picosecond or, or even uh, 100 femtoseconds per day. Where is that going to go? It's, it's an interesting question. So, so maybe you think someone got to the top of that mountain, but Maybe it's just a false summit. Maybe there's something else up there. So I think that's a great thing about science is, is there's always, and, and time in fact, there's, there's no fundamental limit to how accurate a clock can be. So there's still room to grow and improve. One thing that, that, is, that is true in all of these is that the frequency of the oscillator has been increasing as we go here, okay? From say one hertz for a pendulum, you know, quartz is maybe 10 kilohertz, the first cesium clocks, it was about 10 gigahertz. Now with optical clocks, we're in the 500 terahertz to petahertz range. So, so maybe in the future, the best clocks will tick at even faster rates. Maybe it's going to be 100 petahertz. That means they're going to be operating, right, not at, not at green wavelengths, but at ultraviolet or, or X-ray, soft X-ray wavelengths. Another interesting number is to, is to look at the, the rate of improvement of these clocks. Since 1950, it's gone about 1.2 decades every 10 years. So that's, that's actually a, a pretty steep slope. And in fact, there's another very famous slope, which some of you may know about, Moore's Law, which is the growth of uh, transistors on a, on a semiconductor chip. So Moore's Law, it, since 1970, it's been about one and a half decades every 10 years. So, so actually comparable to the, to the rate of growth of clocks. Of course, I think there's, there's little doubt that, that in all of physics, the transistor and all that it brought is probably singularly the most important development that ever came out of physics. Um, so so I'm, I'm not saying that, that clocks are, are of equal importance, but the, the, the growth rate is quite interesting. And even then, that aside, I think there's a lot of interesting scientific and societal effects that have been born out of clocks. And so for society as a whole, I think, you know, if, if transistor is number one, 
uh, clocks have to be in the top 10, I would say, as technological developments that have really impacted our world. So here, here's that plot again, and I, I'll show you a few of these. For example, this Harrison chronometer, as I mentioned, was the first kind of clock that could survive on a boat bouncing up and down and rocking back and forth, okay? You know, a pendulum isn't going to do that, but he came up with a very clever spring mechanism that could survive that kind of motion, and it enabled the, the, the British Navy to sail for the first time back and forth across the Atlantic without crashing into, you know, some rocks somewhere. When people got pendulum clocks, or, or certainly when you got to the level of quartz clocks, you could actually start to see the variation in the rotation rate of the Earth. So there was, there was now something that was precise enough to tell you that, oh, the Earth is not rotating purely, periodically, okay? There's some variation. So, so people were able to see that with quartz. So there's new, new geophysics. And with the cesium clock, we then, we then surpassed ephemeris time. That's, that's how well you can tell time by the stars, okay? And Although it's interesting that as clocks got better, people could compare clocks to, to, to millisecond pulsars. These are spinning astrophysical objects that emit bursts of radiation every time they spin around. And in fact, in, in the 1990s, a professor from Princeton, Joe Taylor, got a Nobel Prize for, being the, for, for observing the, the period of one of these spinning pulsars. And comparing that to atomic clocks and watching how it slowly slowed down with time. And that was, in fact, the first indirect observation of gravitational waves. It matched the theory beautifully. He could predict that these, these pulsars were, were emitting gravity waves, and that's why they were slowing down. They were emitting energy. So there's a, there's a really an interesting application of clocks in physics. Maybe the most important use of clocks is, is GPS, right? This is, this is something that, that now you could not imagine our world functioning without. There's, there's got to be, on the scale of a billion GPS receivers sold every year, it's in every smartphone, it's in you know, every taxi cab, every, you know, even appliances of different sorts have, have GPS in them. Again, probably some of the most interesting applications of, of the most advanced clocks come back to basic science. And for example, at this level, you can see with a clock, if you raised it 10 centimeters, you can see that it, it, it runs a little faster due to general relativity. So clocks can, time and space at this level become intimately entwined. You cannot talk about keeping time without knowing your position in the gravitational potential any longer. So I think that it's interesting that, that clocks will come back and, and will play a role in, in relativity. So everyone here wants to get rich and famous, right? <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's right. But it, th th there's been a lot of, I don't know that any of these people got rich, but they're famous. And actually, some of them are really nice people. And I think it's always great in science to have, to have role models and people to aspire to. So if you want to join the ranks of people messing around with precision timekeeping, you're, you're in good company. You know, and, and, and much of this is also related to laser development. You know, starting from, from Robbie who developed these first atomic spectroscopy techniques. Here's Towns and Basov and Prokhorov, um, the, the development of lasers and masers, right? Norman Ramsey, Hans Daimelt, Wolfgang Paul, trapping ions, atomic spectroscopy. Here, here's the work that, that Professor Bagnato introduced, the work of cooling and trapping, BEC, and, and here in 2005, the work related to, to measuring frequencies with femtosecond precision of Hall and, and Hench and Glauber. Well, Glauber got it for quantum optics. And then most recently, Dave Wineland and Serge Hiroche, because clocks at some level become quantum measurements and quantum experiments. And, and at NIST and in Boulder, we're very proud. I mean, John Hall was my mentor as a postdoc. Dave Wineland works down the hall from me, Eric Cornell across the, the, the street. Bill Phillips is in NIST East near, near Washington, D.C., but it's really an honor to, to get to interact with people like that. So um, you probably won't get rich, but I think you'll have a lot of fun studying this kind of topic as well as, as the topics that, that other people here presented. I think this is really an exciting and continues to be an exciting area of physics. Why do we need better clocks? Okay, so gosh, is it 
second? I mean, I just got to make it to the bus. I don't need a second. I need maybe, you know, if you live in like Japan or, or Switzerland where the trains run on time, maybe you need 30 seconds. <laughs> in the US, you know, you're lucky if the train is there plus or minus an hour. <laughs> so um, what do you need a better clock for? Well, well, from a metrology point of view, <clears throat> time and frequency are, are, are really the best known physical quantities and they, they anchor the, the SI, the system international of units, the meter, the kilogram, voltage and current, all build off of the measurement of time. So it's, it's kind of, it, it, I, I forgot who said it yesterday, but if you can measure time or frequency, do that. It's the thing you can do. Okay, and then cast other measurements in, term of that, in terms of that. The, the, the long-standing technologies that really require clocks are navigation and communication. It, it really hasn't changed since the time of the British Navy, is that, is that you know, now we have atomic clocks in space that are helping us navigate around the world. As the clocks get better, those, those clocks are about um, four orders of magnitude, four or five orders of magnitude worse performance than the very best laboratory clocks. Okay, so, so we, we have quite a head start on them in the lab. But if you go back 30 years ago, when, or, or 25 years ago, when those satellites were first being launched, no one had any idea that there would be billions of people using the signals from those atomic clocks to find their way around the world. And so I think we are strongly motivated by the idea. It's a little bit, if you, if you build it, they will come, right? And we just know these are such important technologies that, that people will keep using them. Communication is another one. If, if you want to, to stuff more information, right? You know, we, we joke, if you want to download more cat videos from the internet, <laughs> you know, you, you, need, you need more bandwidth. And there's, there's a few ways to get more bandwidth, okay? You can think of it in the time domain. You can, in a piece of optical fiber, you can stack up pulses faster and faster, right? But if there's jitter in those pulses, if they aren't properly timed, at some point they run into each other and the information gets garbled. Or in the frequency domain, it's, it's this kind of wavelength division or frequency division multiplexing. It happens both in optical and in the microwave domains. But if you, if you try to light at different, or, or information at different carriers, if the carriers are moving around, at some point, they interfere as well. In fact, in the telecom, they, they have to have, and, and in radio frequency communication, they have, to have guard bands. They have to, okay, we know that our, our oscillator, our clock is so good, but we gotta give a little extra room, just in case it strays out so it doesn't mess up the next guy's channel. So th these are all areas in which, as you can synchronize and, and reduce the noise, the jitter in clocks, it's going to find more and more use. I mentioned geodesy, you know, the ability to, to measure gravitational redshift now at kind of the centimeter scale. It turns out that that's a very important problem for, um, in, in our climate now. There's a lot of melting ice, if you haven't heard. And where, where is all that water going to go? And water doesn't necessarily follow the, the elevation. It actually follows the gravitational poten potential, which is exactly what clocks measure. And okay, maybe it doesn't matter coming out of a mountain down a stream into a valley, but some areas where it's very flat, understanding which way the water is going to go when it grows by 10 centimeters or half a meter could be a very important problem. And of course, there's, there's probes for new physics. I think this is what people keep looking for at, at the top of that mountain or pushing a little harder. You know, if, if having better time and frequency tools or clocks, it allows you kind of like an early microscope to look down into nature with even higher and higher precision. And so, you know, if we, if we can see something at 15 digits, you know, what would we learn new if we can now look at it with 18 digits of precision? There's some, some kind of interesting, some a little crazy ideas out there. Our, our the constants that define the energy structure in atoms and molecules, are they really constant? Do they depend on gravitational field? Do they depend on, you know, T0 since the Big Bang? Um, there are people, in fact, we've, 
uh, maybe I'll show you in my last lecture some, some measurements we've, we've made about this to try to test whether the fine structure constant, for example, is really constant. I, I mentioned, you know, local position invariance. That's kind of, is, is physics the same in every position, in every, in every, um, in, in, in any coordinate frame or as we're moving around the, the, the sun here? Tests of, of quantum electrodynamics people are trying to do that by measuring and calculating the energy structure of atoms to higher and higher precision, and that's what clocks enables you to do. And I, I already mentioned astrophysics and this area of, of millisecond pulsars. Finally, uh, you know, in the future, it's, it's a little bit murky, but, you know, quantum state engineering, and, and this is where people like Dave Wineland come into it, is that ultimately you're going to get to a limit where you can't do any better than the, the, the classical noise levels of the atoms permit. And at that point, if you want to make better clocks, you will have to use entanglement. And people have already done simple demonstrations where they, they entangle ions or atoms in traps to get an improvement in your ability to keep time. Um, I think that's, that's certainly an area of research for the future. Okay, so that, that was a rather broad background. Where am I at in time? Okay, so that's, that's not so bad. Okay, so, so I hope that gave you some idea of where this field lies. And, you know, I, I deliberately, I painted a little broader. You know, I, I, there wasn't a whole lot of nonlinear optics or, um, you know, nanophotonics in that, but, but we'll start to move in that direction now. So, so let's, let's start talking about um, counting optical cycles. So here's a picture of a, of a laser, a titanium sapphire laser that we built some years ago that we used for, for making these kinds of measurements. And I, I thought, I, I enjoy kind of cool pictures, as you can tell. Um, this laser is made, it's a 10 gigahertz repetition rate. So there's a tiny cavity between these mirrors here. This is the titanium sapphire is holding here. And here's, here's our laboratory mascot. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's a funny story. I went to one of my colleagues who makes these tiny chip scale clocks, and I said, I want to take a picture of this. This is pretty small. Do you have any insects? Or do you, do you, have, what do you, do you have something that I can put next to it to show the scale? And she goes to her office, and she opens up a little box, and she had all kinds of little bugs and insects in there. And so she gave me this one. And he's, if you look carefully, his wings are a little beat up. So he was kind of dried out, so, but did a good job there. So, so how do you count optical cycles? <clears throat> so um, just refresh our memory about what that means. So optical frequency is like the speed of light divided by 600 nanometers. That's 500 terahertz. That means the, the period of the cycle, about two femtoseconds, OK? Two times 10 to the minus 15 seconds. What's the fastest electronics? You know, state-of-the-art research electronics, it kind of is petering out around the, the terahertz level, a picosecond. You know, the, the stuff that you have in your phone, right, it's a gigahertz. You know, maybe in the lab, some 10 or research comm stuff, 100 gigahertz. But once you get up to terahertz, the, the physics of the semiconductor materials, things just don't move much faster. So how could you... How could you get around that if we want to try and count these optical cycles? Well, one idea would be to use optical heterodyne. And this is the experiment, actually, that, that Ali Javan did early on, and, and Jan Hall also did early on in his career, is you measure the beat note between two optical frequencies. So, so what does that look like? Okay? If we have an optical frequency 1 and optical frequency 2, and here we see that they're laid out kind of in femtoseconds. We can't measure those frequencies directly. But if we, if we interfere them, right, and mix them together, we can detect a, a beat frequency. And that's just the same as in the audio frequency, the wow, 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 that you get if you have two acoustic tuning forks next to each other, right? And, and if you do the math, you learn that the, the carrier is the average of the two frequencies, but the envelope, this, this envelope here, is, goes at the difference. And, and just to, to make that clear, let's imagine these were two signals that were at 500 terahertz, okay? And one of them differed by 10 megahertz. 
If you subtract them, then that, that beat frequency is 10 megahertz, and you can count that, okay? And, and this is really, in, it, it's simple, but it's, it's quite interesting. If we add one hertz here, okay, then this is 10 megahertz plus one hertz. So optical heterodyne has the ability to count and keep track of optical cycles, all right? But, but what's the catch, all right? It, it, the catch is it's a countable frequency, but only a relative one. We only know this frequency relative to this one with the precision that we know that one. So it's a bit like playing a game of, okay, I could measure, I could count this one relative to this one, but wait, what was that one? Okay, so then you go back and you try and do it again, all right? So, so that, that turns out to be a really important tool and we use it all the time, but the real problem is knowing what the reference frequency is. So what's another idea? How about, we, we already learned there, someone mentioned that, that the ratio of frequencies of optical to microwave is about 10 to the 5, okay? What about direct multiplication? What if we could take a microwave frequency? We, we learned about some about frequency doubling, right? Frequency doubling not only in, in this nonlinear physics of frequency doubling, it was actually first discovered in, in the microwave domain, and that's what, that's what Schottky diodes and different kinds of electronic devices do for you, is if you put enough power on one of those, out come harmonics. Okay, so what if we started with, with 10 gigahertz and we, we tried to multiply up to the optical domain? Well, let's, let's do the math. It's about 100,000, that's about 2 to the 16, okay? So we need 16 multipliers, right? Can you do that, you think? Well, there, there were some, some very brave people who tried that in the, in the 70s and 80s because they saw the promise. They said, we, we got good cesium clocks and people like Ali Javan and Jan Hall have, have good lasers. Could we connect from the cesium clock to the laser by direct multiplication? And here's a picture from the NIST lab in the 80s. They, in fact, there were, there, this gentleman here, I just want to point out, Ken Evenson, um, had a good relationship with many Brazilians from this institute also. And I, when I first came there, there were always some, some Brazilian visitors working with him. But um, he's kind of big, 100, it, it was a big experiment, you know, maybe the size of this room or something like that. And, and here's, here's how it went, okay? And, and the numbers are too small for you to read, but each one of these little X's here is a multiplier, okay? So you'd start at 10 gigahertz and you would multiply from one oscillator up to the next one. And then you would multiply again up to the next one. You multiply again up to the next one. And at the very top here, you come out with 520 terahertz, okay? So let's count. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten stages. Well, I had 16. Hey, actually, these guys were pretty smart, and they figured out that in the microwave domain, you could, you did, these diodes, for example, you hit it hard enough, and not just second on it comes out, but third, fourth, fifth. So early on here, you could, you could do factors of four or eight. So you could eliminate some of these stages. But up here at the very top, it was, it was factors of two to go from, from you know, helium neon at 1.5, you know, up to the, the, the yellow line, this 520 nanometers. So, so this is one idea, and actually this worked amazingly. It took about, I don't know, 15 scientists, and so, I would joke there was kind of one scientist, or maybe it wasn't 15, 10 or so, there was one scientist per stage here. It was a big effort. And it, the kind of, this was called a frequency chain, or a harmonic frequency chain. And this worked at a few places, like NIST, um, developed in MPL in England, the PTB, and in Russia, France. But, but these really were not general or practical or cost effective. You could come from, from Cesium up to here and you got one color out. <laughs> so then you got a bit of a problem, right? Well, what if, what if that one color, color is, is yellow and the, my color of interest or frequency of interest is red, okay? So this, this is really not a general tool. So how are we gonna solve that? Well, along came this thing called the laser frequency comb in about the year 2000. And that ends up, it, it was a fantastic solution for that. So if you, Wanted to learn about that, of course, what's the first thing you would do? Google, yeah. <laughs> if you aren't careful and you leave the word frequency out, 
the top hit is laser comb is this company, hairmax.com. You can feel good about your hair again. This is, <laughs> I don't know. Has anyone tried this? It's called phototherapy. So as far as I can tell, it's like a little brush. And they put some, some LEDs in there. And then you're supposed to comb your hair with the brush every day. And the light is supposed to stimulate your hair and make it grow or make it prettier or something. I don't know. You, you got to believe it because there's, there's laser research involved. <laughs> and I like this. I used to have only one or two good hair days a month. Now every day is a good hair day. <laughs> so so every, everyone needs a, that, that's what you get if you have a laser comb, but not a laser frequency comb. In fact, last night I was, I, you know, you, go, you take Google to different country, countries, right? And it, it, I get google.br. So what google.br give? It's kind of interesting. Laser comb, Brazil. And, and it's, it's in Valinhos. It's, it's actually very close to here. And it turns out, though, this, this looks legitimate. They must be using lasers for some sort of machine or printing type device. But anyway, I thought that was, that was interesting as well. OK, that's not really what we're talking about. What, what, is, what is a laser frequency comb? And let's see, maybe I, I realize we're coming to time here. I just have a few more slides on this, and then we'll, we'll stop. So I, I like to say, what, you know, there's many different ways you can look at a frequency comb. It's, it could be a, a ruler for light frequencies. And what does that look like? Well, it's, it's a laser that emits a broad spectrum that if you can look inside that spectrum, there's a wide array of comb teeth. And, and just like a ruler has markings on it, this laser comb is perfectly spaced markings at the repetition rate of this laser. Alternative view is that the laser comb is, is a perfectly spaced train of optical pulses. So this is a laser that, that produces pulses that come out in a very periodic fashion, OK? So here, here now, instead of frequency, is time. And each pulse that comes out is spaced by the inverse of this spacing up here. We call that the repetition rate. So what, what we're getting at, and I'll show you a picture in a minute, is that light is going around a cavity in a pulse. And each time, a little bit of that light comes out, and, and these are the, the these are be what you would see. We start to have to think a little bit in the in twisting back and forth between the time and frequency domains here. And here in the frequency domain, the bandwidth of this spectrum, and, and Roy talked a little about how you get short pulses, right? If you're going to have something short in time, there's kind of a Heisenberg limit, if you want, or a time bandwidth relationship. If you want something short in time, it has to be broad in frequency, OK? So, so the breadth of the frequency spectrum up here is related to the shortness of the pulse down here. So these are just Fourier transform pairs. We'll come back to this in a minute. But uh, another kind of nice picture of a frequency comb is that it's, it's, a, it's an optical clock. It's a set of gears that work for light. OK? It's not mechanics, but I, I really like this analogy because it explains exactly what a frequency comb does in a nice picture. A frequency comb will take some optical frequency, a little wheel. Think of that as you know, each tooth is a wavelength of light. OK? And it divides that down to, by a factor of 100,000 or so to the microwave domain. And it's, it's even more useful than that in that you can enmesh different optical frequencies. It's a very multi-purpose set of gears and, and reconfigurable to address any optical frequency. If I want to compare one gear to another, I can do that via this frequency comb. The gears are perfect, as far as we can tell, to like the 20th decimal place. This allows the measurement of these optical frequencies and, and this direct connection to the microwave domain. So let me, let me leave you with one more picture, and then we'll just stop for a break. So, so now let's get, I keep stepping closer and closer to reality, right? <laughs> Start with very abstract pictures. So what, is, what did one of these things really look like? OK, so, so here we go. Here's an example of a, a titanium sapphire laser. That, that little laser with the fly on it, it's this kind of laser, OK? And in this laser, there's a bullet of light, or call it a pancake of light, actually. It's photons 
compressed to about a, a length duration of about 30 microns. You know, it's the beam of light. It's 100 microns, a few hundred microns around. So it's like a pancake of light going around this cavity. And each time light comes out, there's an output coupler. A little bit of that light emits out. And if you took a snapshot, this is what you would see from pulse to pulse. As you would see, and, and if you could zoom in to that little bullet of light, what would you see? You would see a burst of light, and that's the envelope here. And if you had femtosecond eyes, okay, you could see a few oscillations of, of the light cycle. And then the next time it came around, you would see something that would be the same. And if you didn't look carefully, you would think, oh, it's, it's just another burst of light. But there's an there's a interesting detail in that this carrier you see is shifted by this amount delta phi relative to the envelope, okay? And then the next round trip, it's two delta phi, okay? So, so what's happening there is this pulse goes around the cavity, and as it goes around the cavity, it hits things like air, it goes through a piece of, of dielectric media, the titanium dope sapphire, it bounces off a mirror. In each of those elements, there is dispersion. And when you have dispersion, you learn that the group and the phase velocity of the light are not the same. So each round trip, the, which, which goes faster, group or phase velocity? Quiz time. <laughs> phase, yeah, OK. So each round trip, the phase advances relative to the group. And that's what's being shown here. OK, and, and the Fourier transform of this just like I explained in the previous slide, gives you the frequency cone. So this is, these are connected by the Fourier transform. With one, one key detail, detail is that carrier envelope phase shift is responsible for what we call the offset frequency. And this, is, this turned out to be probably the, the key feature that had been overlooked for you know, a few decades, or at least was not accessible for a few decades in the development of mode lock lasers up until about 2000. And that, that offset frequency, there's different ways you can think about that. These comb teeth are exactly harmonics of each other. And if you extrapolated them all the way back to zero, what you would find is that a comb tooth doesn't lie at zero. There's a small offset, OK? That offset is given by exactly the, the, the ratio or it's related to this carrier envelope phase slip by, by this expression that I show here. It's, it's 2 pi times the ratio of the offset frequency to the repetition rate. So if the offset frequency were 0, OK, that would mean that this value is 1 and that every pulse that comes out of this laser is identical, not only in envelope, but in carrier, OK? If, it was, if the offset frequency was was one half of the repetition rate, then delta phi would be pi. And so that one pulse would come out, let's call it a, a, a sine pulse, and, or a, a, maybe I call it a cosine, and then the next pulse would be, the field would be 180 degrees inverted, okay? As I drew it here, it's something like, you know, pi on two or something from pulse to pulse. The, the carrier phase is evolving. So that turns out to be a, a real important observation, and it leads and this is where I'll stop for now. This direct link between optical and microwave frequencies that, that now the frequency of each tooth of that comb, I call it nu sub n, is just an integer times this mode spacing plus this offset frequency with n on the order of 10 to the 5. There's your multiplier. And, and it's this very simple equation that allows you now to very directly connect microwave frequencies. So, so these rates for the repetition rate and offset frequency are in the order of gigahertz or 100 megahertz, OK? So these are microwave frequencies, easily countable. One multiplies by an integer, and then you're up in the optical domain. So I think I'll stop there. I'd be happy to ask any, answer any questions, but I guess everyone will take a little break. And um, does that work all right? OK.